Have you always admired those gorgeous, rather expensive pleated lampshades that you see in English country homes? Have you been wondering how to make an easy no-sew pleated lampshade that looks professional? Hello friend, I'm Rachel, creator of the blog Stone Cottage Home where we cultivate the art of home from our heart with our hands. Have you been dreaming of adding more English cottage style to your home through those beautiful pleated lampshades? I have too, but like you, I cannot bring myself to make that kind of an investment for the prices I see online. Today, I will share with you a simple technique on how to make an easy no-sew professional crisp looking pleated lampshade. We'll talk about fabric choices, lining, and trim. Be sure to stick around to the end where I'll share with you one of my favorite ways to add a little extra touch of vintage charm and make your lamp easier to use. If you've been around my channel for any length of time, you will know this is my second pleated lampshade tutorial. This here is a clip from my first tutorial, which shows how to make a pleated lampshade from whole cloth. This takes a lot more time and skill, and it's more difficult to get all of those little pleats to line up uniformly. Once you pin each pleat in place, then it is hand tacked with quilting thread and covered with a trim. While I do think the lamp is very sweet and it turned out to be cute, it does look a bit more like a homemade DIY project than I would prefer. I am sure with time and practice, this could be perfected to look professional. I do want to say that this size lamp has been extremely useful in several different places in our house. It currently brightens a corner of our country cottage kitchen. The lamp in question for today's project is this beautiful pot-bellied brass lamp that I found on Marketplace for $50. It came with the shade which is always a good idea for starters since the shade and the lamp will have been matched to balance each other out. This shade has been made in a flared box pleat pattern with a soft ivory or off-white color and matching trim. The lining is a little bit lighter, more of a soft white and is either silk or polyester. It's a high quality shade and well worth remaking. Before starting your project, it's a good idea to try out the fabric against your lampshade with the light on. My fabric has a much whiter background than the covering presently on the shade, so that's something I have to keep in mind when holding it up here. I have bunched it up together to see how much light will permeate once it is pleated. This simple exercise will help you know how densely or sparsely to pleat your lamp. It also gave me the idea to center that frond on the middle of the shade. Since my fabric is extremely lightweight cotton, I decided to go ahead and starch it. It's one of those things that's an extra step, but the result of how crisp it will turn out in the end is completely worth it. The next step is to measure your shade from top to bottom so you will know how wide to make your panels. With my measurement, I add an inch top and bottom so that I have a little extra to work with. I'm also taking the time to center this frond or fern motif in the middle of my panel. Any extra pieces I am saving for self-trim later on. Once I have my panel straight, I count down exactly what size I need, line everything up, and give it a good, quick cut. This process is repeated for the length of my fabric. I already love how much more intentional this looks with that motif centered on the panel. 
I'm cutting my strips two and a half inches wide and as you can see that motif is landing right in the middle. Sometimes it's these little details that crop up along the way which make all the difference. Now it is time to press our strips. I fold under the bottom side about half an inch, a shy half an inch, and do exactly the same thing across the top edge, which makes both of those raw edges meet on the back side of your strip. With my lightweight fabric, I'm very glad that I starched as it is giving me a crisp edge and keeping everything in place. Now before you go too far and cut all your strips and do all your pressing, it's a good idea to do a little sample section on your lampshade. Just hold it up and see how it will look. And then continue. I have finished making my strips and the next step is to deconstruct the lampshade. First I remove the trim top and bottom. I save both of these pieces as sometimes I do reuse them depending on the color. In this case, I will need them to know the correct length to make my trim. Deconstructing a lampshade is pretty straightforward. You must remove the pleated fabric. And in this case, I discovered that the lining was very fragile and had to be careful not to puncture or put pressure on it. Now for the fun part, I begin applying my strips. First a dot of glue is put on top and bottom, and then the strip is put over one of the ribs on the lampshade to be sure my design stays straight. The second strip is applied in the same method, except that it begins to flare very slightly at the bottom to allow for the wider width on the bottom than the top of the lampshade. Those ribs are very helpful as they are checkpoints from section to section to help you make sure that your strips are going on uniformly. For my particular lampshade, the top was overlapped, leaving about a quarter of an inch of the previous pleat showing, and the bottom about a half an inch. Here you see I'm preparing to make the trim for top and bottom. First I measure both pieces and then I cut from a fabric that is the same color as the background of my printed fabric. Since the trim will be laying over quite a number of layers with all those pleats, I only cut two inches so there is less bulk to put the trim on. Here's another trick for reducing bulk when making trim. Place your strips at right angles to each other, leaving the ends overlapping about a quarter of an inch, and sew from corner to corner. This will give you a seam that is diagonal across your trim, giving it nice stretch and allowing it to lie flat when you apply it to your lamp. Here you see the seam, and I will trim off that extra fabric on the back, leaving about a quarter of an inch seam allowance. Since I decided to center the motif from my lampshade design, I wanted to keep the edges simple and white to not take away from that design. If you don't want to make your own trim for a true no-sew lampshade, you can buy bias tape from Joann's, which we will be taking a trip there near the end of our visit. For pressing the trim that goes along the top and bottom of the lampshade, it's very similar to making the pleats. There is one subtle difference. You do match the edges on top and bottom. Then you take one edge and bring it up almost to the other, leaving a little bit of a lip showing. Since the trim is the very last thing you apply to your lamp and the most visible, it pays to take your time and make sure that it is very straight. Now I have all of my strips on the lamp and it is time to trim off the extra top and bottom. We're getting close, it's the last step. Here you see I am putting a thin bead of hot glue along the top and applying the first piece of trim. Most likely this is not a step you will need to do, and here's why. I didn't realize as I was putting the pleats on that the lining was getting extra stress and starting to pull away. So to reinforce and to cover the small tears, I went ahead and wrapped a piece of trim around top and inside. 
but for a better, more professional looking finish, I went ahead and put a second layer of the trim that we ironed with that lip over top. So for your project, you will only need to apply this single layer of trim. The wonderful thing about working with fabric is that it has give and you're able to fix things along the way. Here you can see that ironed lip got a little bit off track. I go ahead and put the trim down, then go back in with the hot glue gun, add a little bit of glue, and pull that top lip into place so that it is perfectly straight. All of this is easy to do while the glue is still warm and you can adjust. Okay, the top is done. Let's move on to the bottom, which is freshly trimmed. Applying the lower trim was a bit easier since I didn't have an under piece of trim to work with. You can see here, if you look closely, that diagonal seam where we join two pieces of fabric to make our strip long enough. Now I'm getting to the end and what I do is size it to fit, mash it to create a crease, and then cut leaving a quarter inch tab underneath. Then hot glue, fit it into place and adjust while the glue is still warm. And there you have it. As promised, let's look at one of my favorite ways to add a vintage touch to your lamps and make them easier to use. Start by removing the fitting and then unscrewing the wires. During this process, please be sure that your lamp is unplugged for safety. There will be two screws holding wires to loosen. Once the screws are loosened, unhook the wires from around them and discard the switch piece. Then remove the base. At this point, you are already halfway through. All you need to do from here is simply the same process in reverse. Thread the two wires up through the bottom of your new base, drop into place, and then tighten the entire thing. In case you have a hunch of what we're going to do here, I did find a kit with all of these pieces to where you could switch out from a turn switch lamp to a pull chain lamp. For those of you that are interested, I will have this product linked for you below. Next, Matt is adding the socket with the pull chain feature versus the switch. He wraps the two wires around the screws and tightens them. I must say I was rather fascinated with this whole process and surprised how simple it was. It's not quite as mysterious or difficult as I had thought and I would feel perfectly comfortable doing this myself. Once the wires are tightened, Matt sets the socket in place and then covers it with the sleeve that comes with the kit. He presses everything firmly together and snugs the socket into the base. Looks as if it has always been there. In my experience, it's so much easier to see and use a pull chain then to go searching up inside the lampshade and getting it all crooked trying to find the switch. Besides, the click is so charming. Now let's take a look at our finished, no sew, pleated lampshade. I'm very pleased with how the pattern came out by centering the motif in the middle of the lampshade. I also interspersed those strips with some plain strips to allow more light to filter through. There's that beautiful pull chain. Here's a look at the lamp with it off and I love how crisp and uniform all the pleats are and how professional the trim looks. In case you're interested, the fabric came from India and it is a hand block print in blue and gray 
They also had it in Goldenrod and Sage, and it is sold on Etsy, and I will link the shop for you below. I was pleasantly surprised with a bonus project from the leftovers of this pleated lampshade. I laid out the remaining strips and chose a small lampshade and was able to get two projects out of one. While they are similar, the position of the print and the shape of the shades gives them a distinct look. Here is what they look like turned on and you can see how the light is different in both of them. One of them a little brighter and wider, the other a little more soft and warm. Here's a look at the before and after. Plain white, printed and pleated, and then our bonus lamp. Very French looking to a little bit more English cottage. Now let's talk about fabric choices. This one here would give a muted light. This one here with a blush pink undertone would be very flattering. This one is a beautiful, delicate stripe, which you could put going up and down, or you could run horizontally. The soft ivory background on this one would give really good light. All of the choices I'm showing here are a quilter grade cotton fabric. I love this one with the little orange berries. And here for a different tone is a blue, which you could trim in the butterscotch color. And then as far as scale goes, don't be afraid to use a larger scale. This bright red would also filter very well. And here is the fabric that I chose. You can see it's quite a large scale and it's interesting to me how different the fabric looks pleated versus when you're looking at it flat. To get an idea of what your fabric might look like pleated, it's a good idea to just kind of roughly hand pleat it and see how the design will fall and how the light might filter through. If you have a specific color or scale or style in mind, a good place to go is your local quilt shop. This is one that I go to on occasion and it is my absolute favorite. This is also a good place to go if you're simply looking for inspiration and you don't have any ideas, but just a kind of a rough color palette in mind. A good rule of thumb to keep in mind when you're choosing fabrics is those that are lighter in color will allow more light to filter through. Those that are warm based will cast a warm light, while those that have a blue base or a cool undertone will cast a blue light. So think about those things when you're picking fabrics. Do you prefer a warm light or do you prefer a cool light? If you are a beginner at making pleated lampshades, you might consider choosing a smaller all over pattern versus one that has a strong directional print or stripes as it takes more time and effort to make sure everything is lined up. One of the wonderful things you might discover at your local quilt shop is they have lines of reproduction fabrics that can give you that older world look. These that we're looking at here are reproductions from the Civil War and as you can see they come in a myriad of colors. On the other hand, if you're looking for something more whimsical, you will be able to find that as well as any style in between. Now that we've looked at probably hundreds of fabric choices, let's take a peek at Joann's and see what they have in the trim department. There is no shortage of options here either, as you will find ribbon in every color and print imaginable. I would definitely suggest buying your fabric first and bringing it here to do a pattern and color match. I found that the decorative trim was divided into two categories. This row, which was all ribbon, some of it grow grain and plain, and some of it with print on it. And then the other aisle was a more proper trim that you might even use on upholstery or throw pillows. In my experience, the ribbon that is easiest to use is about, oh, three quarters of an inch wide any wider than that and it tends to ripple as you put it on the lampshade. Any narrower than that, it's hard to position and doesn't adequately cover the glue. Mm -hmm. 
Now we've reached the trim aisle and the variety here is just as broad, although a lot of it is too thick or bulky than what you would use on a lampshade. I would consider a couple of things when looking at trim. For one, we've used a real fabric made of cotton. So looking for fabric trim that is made from real materials and not polyester or synthetics would be more in keeping with the style of your lamp. Next, consider scale. If you have a smaller lampshade, then get a petite trim. If you have a larger lampshade, it can handle a heftier trim. Some of these handmade crochet laces would be gorgeous on a little girl lampshade in a bedroom. I guess there's actually three things I would keep in mind. So the third one would be, is the fabric going to be the feature or is the trim going to be the feature? And that would change the style of the trim and the colors and the patterns you would use even for your fabric. Trim tassel and pom-poms are also very fun and eye-catching. And I've also seen where people will buy a larger tassel and hang it from the finial on the top of the lamp draped over the side. This adds another detail and layer that's so chic. Okay, this tassel is a little too big. <laughs> On this end of the aisle, the trim is starting to get bigger and bigger, and some of it actually is reminding me of a mop head. <laughs> but it has been really fun to see what my options are, what's out there, and to get ideas for trim I might use on a future lampshade. Here is a variety of tassels that are in the proper scale for the lampshades that you and I will most likely be making. Now for those of you who are looking for the true no-sew trim to add to your lampshade, let's go take a look at the bias tape. This is the manufactured trim, the same as to what you saw me making earlier in our visit. It comes in a rainbow of colors and different widths. I would suggest the half inch wide double fold bias tape. Here's another fun fact I've picked up. When the words pleated lampshade are used, they're often applied to a variety of styles where the fabric is gathered to a shade. Most of the time they're pleated, sometimes they're shirred. This one is pleated at the bottom and shirred on top. Shirring is simply a fine gathering of the fabric and a style that I would love to try. So the next time you're at a thrift store, take a look at all of the different shapes and sizes of lampshades. There are so many fun, affordable options out there. This pair would probably be $7 with tax. The shades are great. The linings are in perfect condition. I'm not crazy about the base, but those could be swapped or painted. This ceramic lamp with the deep navy intricate patterns and brass base would possibly pair well with a strong red pattern for the lampshade. In this collection of lamps, I saw a beautiful jade green with a fabulous lampshade. I didn't get it because one of the golden ears was missing, but now I wonder if you couldn't just remove the other one. Here are a few examples of shirred lampshades, and you know for sure you can make one for less than $650. Friend, if you're anything like me and you're always looking for more ways to add those English country layers to your home on a budget, be sure to subscribe. Also, our English country dining room makeover is coming soon. I'm already looking forward to our next visit. Thank you for dropping by and take care.